Uh, okay, so do do we want to? <laughs> <laughs> be warned <laughs> uh, all right so uh, would you mind going around and, and then introducing yourselves because uh, I don't think uh, most of us here have well I mean we, we probably know each other online but <laughs> maybe not uh, through a chat um, so anybody you want to start or okay yeah uh -oh. I, uh -oh. I'll go first. Um, yeah. So yeah, my name's Martin Bentley. I'm with Agile. Um, I've done, I, I contributed a couple of small things to the original, to the sort of Fatiando version one and used it for my masters. Um, and I'm finally getting some time to look at what's happening with the new, with the new stuff and generally really liking it. So. Not sure where. Oh, yeah, there was some yep. other questions in the document. I have to find the document quick. Were there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. So, name, what you do, where you are. And yeah, I had favorite text editor here, but yeah. <laughs> let's not start that whole room. Yeah. Who's really code of him <laughs> if we get a better? <laughs> Uh, and so you're you're still in in South Africa at the moment? Yeah, no, still in South Africa for now. Um, once the world comes back onto a somewhat more even keel, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Cut off your breath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, uh, anybody want to go next? I can go next. Uh, I'm Dan Shapiro. I'm kind of a glaciologist at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, frequent user, sometime contributor to Pooch. Um, I was trying to push people to use it at this uh, hack week for ISAT2 last week, and some folks sound interested, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, cool. And I'm a Vim user. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I think we have consensus here. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. That's a first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so then was this the the uh, the the hack week at, at Washington was it was it Washington State? Uh Washington State is the other university in this state. Ah, okay. And they make they have an agriculture program and they make excellent cheese. That's basically the only. Thing. <laughs> okay. It's in Pullman. It's in a. It, it's it's a shithole. Um, so we're the more cosmopolitan, <laughs> obnoxious ones. Um, so uh, yeah, they, there was a big. They had this last year too. There was a hack week for uh, dealing for using data from ISAT to this new NASA satellite. Mm -hmm. um, so I was helping organize it this year and. Everyone was struggling with like, I have to download a whole mess of data and, you know, we're all using this shared cloud infrastructure. How can we not go crazy doing this? But <laughs> planted the seeds. Nice. Um, it, it, so is this the, the, does it have anything to do with that um, ice picks project? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. That was one of the little sub projects was making some improvements mm -hmm. to that. Nice. Do you know the developer of it, or yeah? So I, I met um, Jessica. Uh, Jessica, yes, I, I met her at AGU last year. Oh, okay. Well, while we still could go out outside and meet with yeah, thirty thousand people, that, that was weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, it's funny because that was an outgrowth of like she was a student and she showed up to the first one and started doing that, and then it became this like, you know, it totally ballooned because people got really interested in it. Um, oh, nice. Cool. But there they have, well, I don't know. They they, they have more of a, an exploration problem of helping people even find and get to the data sets they want in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Small world. Huh? Yep. Very. <laughs> All right. So, um, Santiago, do you want to go next? Okay, uh, I'm Santiago Soler from Argentina. 
and I've been part of Fatiando since 2015. And now I'm gladly leading kind of uh, harmonica and rock hum mainly, and also making contributions to the other packages of Fatiando. So yeah, it's a big part of my PhD thesis. So uh, yeah, I'm glad to see more people here. And of course, I also use BIM. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll go next then for the recording. Uh, so I'm Leo Yeda, I'm in Liverpool, uh, also BIM user. Uh, and I guess we have four different continents then represented here, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, so um, the the way we were sort of thinking of running these things is to do a, a quick round of updates if anybody has anything to share. And we have some stuff in the in the meeting notes as well. If um, uh, so I'm guessing everyone has should have access to that at least uh, on HackMD. And if you want to add anything there as well, please feel free. But till first, uh, so uh, I have a couple of news items, but does anyone else have anything that they would like to share? Um, nothing in particular from my side. Uh, I like the gradient stuff, though, or the derivative stuff. I was looking at that mm -hmm. earlier today. So it seems reasonably intuitive, as since you were asking for API feedback on that. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I gotta find some time to finish that PR. <laughs> yeah, but that that was a nice one. Uh, um, all right, so I guess I'll, I'll go then. Um, one item is that um, SH Tools. So it's this is a, a Spheric Harmonics uh, package. So it's a Fortran wrapped in Python, um, and they they recently started using. Uh, implementing pooch support as well for for gravity data sets and they're looking for feedback on on gravity uh gra which gravity data they should use for earth um so stuff like uh which circ harmonic model i guess like uh, should they have bgm08 should they have uh, the the newer ones and that sort of thing so there's a link to a pr there then if anyone has anything to add i think they they'd welcome that um, and it was nice that they started implementing this because we found a whole bunch of use cases where, um, for example, the the website where they're trying to pull the Spark harmonics from, apparently they make a zip file on the fly. So when you request it, they generate the zip file. But that means that the hash for the zip file changes every time because the date that the zip file is created is included in the file. Um, so right now, there's actually no good way for us to use the the, the hash checking mechanism in Pooch. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, Mark, who, who develops SH Tools, has already contacted them and asked if they're, they're maybe going to do something about that or, or not do that in the future, because <laughs> uh, it kind of breaks our workflow. Um, but yeah, and then uh, I think, uh, Dan, when, when you first started using pooch as well that you had an interesting thing as well where you needed to authenticate and the right password there. protection mm -hmm. business because nasa has decided they want to make people not use all their products <laughs> <laughs> so annoying yeah and and to but but to download uh, the i mean you you can anyone can create an account right Yes. So there's no gatekeeping there. I just miss the good old days when it was all over FTP and I didn't have to deal with this. Yeah. I'm just complaining. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, my guess is that they do that sort of thing so that they can have numbers to show. Um, I imagine it's, it's a bean counting exercise. Uh, it's also partly they do want to reduce the number of people using it because it's expensive and they're confronting mm -hmm. this whole like what are we going to do when 
the next big remote sensing satellite comes online and they they just don't even have the money to send all the data to people so uh yeah. right yeah so i guess they wouldn't be too happy with ci repeatedly downloading their <laughs> their data sets been out of shape about that yeah uh okay good to know <laughs> yeah i think copernicus has um right so the yeah Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think Copernicus has a system very similar where you have to mm -hmm. log in and use. They offer you like a GitHub, like a Python package, uh, and you have to include your uh, API key, so you can uh, download data directly from Python, but you can do it through F FTP or HTTP. So. Yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> the thing that really so it sounds like at least with their with their offering um, is up to date. Whereas NASA had a bunch of scripts on their web page that were in Python two and that broke. For like this is how you download our data from Python, but they they gave you bad code to even do it. Okay, uh, that's nice. <laughs> I, was, I was not happy with them. Huh. So for Copernicus, you mean the, is that for the Sentinel satellites? Uh, I use, I use it for one hackathon on, especially uh, focus on, um, on the atmospheric data, especially. So I, I only work with that one. And yeah, they had the era five model for the global uh, climate weather um yeah so they had records of of uh, weather variables from i don't i don't remember exactly when but yeah historic uh, records of of where data from the era five model it's not like they have uh records of meteorological um meteorological values actually me being measured but it's just the output of the era five models i think there are a lot of the European Space Agency funded stuff is through them. So I think they're also cryosat and. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the kind of challenge you don't think about when dealing with, with potential fields because like our data is tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Even when we have satellites acquiring it, like it's, it's not really, really that that's much why data. Spherical harmonics are so nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't need that many of them. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think we had someone else showing up for a little while. Rolling back. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So the the next piece of news I had was the the uh, transform twenty twenty happened last week. Um. So we had the uh, a Verde tutorial that, that was uh, three hours long, and then uh, me and Santiago gave lightning talks on on some facets of Fatiando. So there's links to those in there. Um, and yeah, not really much to say about those. Actually, the tutorial worked fine. It was it was actually pretty nice to to do some applications with Verde. And, and also use Pooch, uh, the, the new retrieve function, to download the data sets. Uh, the major trouble I had with that is that I, I wanted to emphasize the new cross-validation functions, but uh, I, I think the data set I chose didn't need it. So, <laughs> um, And then I ran out of time to pick a better data set. But yeah, it, it worked. Um, all right, so I think the the major points that that I sort of wanted to discuss was um, from this tutorial and from some of the issues that that popped up recently in Verde. Um, it, it feels like some of these would make would would make the package more of a spatial machine learning thing in, instead of just gridding and and whatever is required for gridding. Right, so some of the requests were for for uh, using a, a classifier as a gridder, 
right? So uh, doing interpolation through classification. Um, and what was the other one? Uh, or someone else had requested using things that aren't coordinates as the, the covariates. So um, interpolating, instead of uh, using distances as measures of proximity, but using other things like uh, using topography or using um, uh, ice thickness, for example, if you're interpolating temperature in, in Antarctica. Um, and that we, we couldn't do that with the current thing that we have in Fatiando, but uh, in, in Verde. But uh, if we made something more generic, the, the thing I had in mind was to have a, a generic gridder that just takes a scikit-learn estimator as one of the inputs. And then, um, then you can use the verde dot fit and dot predict and dot grid methods. But the scikit learn estimator would replace what we currently have inside, which is a basically a, a either a linear regression or a ridge regression, depending on the choice of, of damping. Um, so that would basically make it so that you could do any kind of spatial machine learning with with Reddit and use all the cross validation stuff that we have as well. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure because I don't really know that field very well. In I mean, there's not much of that in Python. There's some of that in R. Um, yeah. So I was actually hoping that Jesse would pop in because he, he had some comments on that, and I think he does more. Um, more of this style of application. Um, but, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how useful it'll be. But um, one of the people with the research group that I was was with, and technically I'm still part of, um, they they focus on um, spatial statisticsy stuff. Um, I can ask if she's doing any. If she's got any thoughts regarding what would be needed for a machine learning package? I don't know how much. Mm -hmm stuff she does with it um mm -hmm. but it's worth asking i guess yeah that would, that would be great i can send her an email and just say hey we're what what would be needed essentially or what what what, what are we really asking um, um basically what what already exists so so what what does she use to do that um whether it's uh, our packages i imagine it's mostly our um but uh, maybe knowing what those R packages are and, and what they do would be a, a, a good starting point. Yeah. I'll find out if she does any sort of proper machine learning or if it's just you know mm -hmm. closer to Krieging and that's sort of as far as she's gone. Mm -hmm. I'll ask. Yeah, which is actually not that far, I guess, from... I mean, the terminology is different, but when you actually mm -hmm. look at what they do, it's, it's really similar. Mm. Yeah. Okay. As I said, uh, so it, I'll send it. Yeah, it might be. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, it it would be. It, it might be interesting to reach out to Michael Perch, who does the uh, Geostat Spy. Um, I think there might be a lot of overlap in there as well. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think his is focused more on traditional geostatistics, so Krigging so and the like. Um, but. Uh, if we he could. seems pretty approachable, so even if he doesn't do it, he might know someone to point at, point us at. Yeah, yeah, and that that might not be too far to reach actually, because I think Jesse works with him. Um, at least they they work at the same place, so I, I'm guessing that that would be an easy connection to make as well. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone has any ideas on that, or maybe just keep that in mind. That, that we we might work towards generalizing Verde a bit more uh, to make it more more of a spatial machine learning thing, uh, which I don't know might be more useful than than it is right now. Uh, what else? Right, the other major thing for me was uh, what you do with the sample data. 
so I kind of came across this when uh, when I was doing um, bool. So when I was stripping away the normal gravity stuff from harmonica into a separate package, um, that's when I kind of wanted to use the sample gravity data from harmonica in bool. But then, like just installing it as, as a dependency would be kind of weird because it would be a somewhat of a circular dependency in there. Um, and, and yeah, installing a package just to load some some of the sample data from that package seems a bit of a waste. Uh, so, so from from last the last time we talked about maybe two options: either having a separate package just for the sample data, and this would be sample data from for all the projects. Um, that would also make it easier for um, other people to reuse the our, our sample data. So you, you could uh, load it in in um, in for some, use it for Simpeg or something like that. Um, so they wouldn't have to implement like a sample data repository. They could maybe contribute to this one or just use it uh, in their their docs. Right. So the options were make a separate package or build that into Rockhound, which already does data download. Uh, yeah, so it's at this point it's mostly a semantics thing, I guess. Um, so I'm, I don't know. I lean more towards doing Rockhound, but I'm I'm interested in in hearing what other people think. I think Rockhound would be a good place for for simple simple data. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel that Brockhound doesn't have too much attention because it has a very few data sets uh, now. Uh, mm -hmm. So having a, a sample data would be better to get more attention and usage. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to be uh, Brockhound to be very thin uh, dependency talking. Uh, I mean, with very few dependencies. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly remember if we asked for Rasterio and those packages that might uh, be needed for some uh, data sets, but they are not very light and might <laughs> cause problems. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, I mean, anyone who tried to install uh, uh, Rasterio in, in in Windows or or even in Linux <laughs> knows that it's a bit of a pain. Yeah. So maybe we could uh, use some the, a similar approach that XRA uses. So for example, if you want to save uh, an XRA into I don't know, uh, I think HD uh, HDF five, you need to import by tables, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's not a dependency, but if you try to say to save um, some XRA into that kind of format, uh, you get an error because you don't have the dependency installed. So maybe we could uh, make those dependencies as optional. Yeah. Uh, so I just checked and and we do. So we have a Pooch, X-Ray, Pandas, Raster.io, Dask, and NetCDF four as as hard dependencies. And I'm guessing like these are, are used by one or two. Like not not every single data set uses Rest.io. It's only uh, I think it's only Badmap yeah. that uses it. Right. And and I think Dask is also only used for Badmap, I think. So yes. um, yeah, we have a lot of dependencies that most people wouldn't need. Um, so I, I agree if it's to be widely adopted, then we need minimal dependencies. Um, well, which is kind of what, what we're trying to do with, with Pooch, just keep everything that's not strictly required um, as optional and keep it out. Uh, though one thing I noticed with Pooch is that the, so we have uh, TQDM as as optional, and that's for drawing the, the little progress bar. But it's hard to get an environment without it, because I think newer versions of Conda are using it. Okay. Uh, 
So I, I kind of noticed that I had it without installing it. So something else uh, pulled it, and I think it might be Conda. So I think at some point, like it could just be a normal dependency because it's up. Uh, chances are, it's going to be Python, there. So yeah, pure yeah, Python, I mean, no dependencies. Yeah, with Raster IO, it could be a pain because GDAL, but <laughs> so yeah. Uh, right. right. So yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so for, for this work, then I guess we, we should strip all of these dependencies out and pretty much only depend on Pooch. Um, and then everything else could be optional. And then we can have some, uh, maybe some function decorators to say, uh, this data loading function requires, um, X array or, or raster IO or something like that. And, and have that print out an error message or, or something like that like catch the import error and then print it out. Um, yeah, so okay, so. I think it makes, I think yeah. it makes sense to pull them, pull them into somewhere else as well. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you don't need the sample data, because you know what you're, you're more or less know what you're doing, then why download them as well? Or have mm -hmm. the facility to download them if you're not needing them. Yeah. Uh, and then right now, Pooch is a dependency on all the projects, even if they're not really using. So even if you're not using the data, that comes as a dependency. And though it's minimal, it does require uh, it, like it's extra stuff, right? You need requests, for example. Um, but but yeah, so if all the sample data are living in other packages, then we could even drop Pooch as a dependency on on all our other packages. And just have Rockhound be like a one stop shop for for sample data. Mm -hmm. uh, the the one thing that would be tricky with this approach is that right now the sample data is tied with the project version. Uh, so when you when you run a very day one point five, it's gonna get a whole new set of sample data. Um, so basically, if you if you install one point five and you look at the docs for one point five. You're guaranteed to get the same plots if you run that code, but if we if we make if we move these things to Rockhound and then we update the sample data somehow, then you might get different results than than what's on the the docs uh, if you update your Rockhound version, for example. How likely is it that the sample data changes, though, at least for the basic yeah. docs? I mean, I, 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 it's it's a valid concern. I'm just, you know, if we're happy with the sample data, then mm -hmm. you know, maybe the the docs might use some. Th the, the docs might have, you know, maybe later on they have access to a new sample data set that isn't in the Rockhound you have. But mm -hmm. that's fairly easy to flag. I feel. Yeah. Uh, Can you specify a, um, say, version one point five of Verde depends on. Exactly, double equals a specific version of Rockhound. Um, so you, you, you see what I'm getting at? Can, yeah, yeah. Um, you can, but Rockhound wouldn't be a dependency on any of these packages. It, it would just be used for the docs. Uh, right. So we we should we should pin it on the CI so that the docs don't change without us realizing it. Um, but since it's not going to really be a, a Hard dependency on the on the soft the, the the packages themselves, then it shouldn't be a problem. But the the problem with pinning it that way is that um, if we if one of our packages suddenly requires a new version of Rockhound, then all of them need to. Otherwise, you can't build an environment with all of them. Right. So if someone else is depending, or, or even if it's if it's our own packages, that's easy to track. But if uh, a simpack is using it and they they want Rockhound 1.0, and we're requiring 1.1, then suddenly you can't install everything. Um, but yeah, so I think with, with a bit of good practice, like maybe printing the Rockhound version in the tutorials or something like that, so that the the version being used in the docs is, is registered somehow, then we should be fine. Um, I mean, I'm also, I'm also thinking of it in terms of the most likely change for data in Rockhound is going to be adding new stuff, not taking stuff out. Yeah. So if it works, if it works now, 
or if it works in three versions time when we've added a bunch of additional stuff to Rockhound, it should still be the same data. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. it shouldn't really make that much difference. Yeah, the, the only cases would be small bug fixes maybe. Um, so I think we, we still have one open in Harmonica, right? Uh, yeah. That when we downloaded the data from, um, from uh, ICGM, so when you request a global grid, it gives you one line, uh, one um, column in the, the big data matrix. There's one column at zero longitude, and there's one column at 360 longitude. So, so it's it's repeated, right? When uh, so the, so there's an extra column in all of our data sets, and. If you're plotting or doing anything just with the maps, it really doesn't matter. But if you're doing an inversion, then suddenly that one strip appears twice, and that would cause um, that would cause a bunch of uh, linearly dependent rows in your your Jacobian matrices. So uh, that would just break any inversion that we would do in that. Uh, and it, it might also break some Fourier transform things. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, that depending on what we do with those. Um, right, so yeah, this is, so there, there might be slight fixes like that, but it wouldn't be anything major. Like, like we wouldn't uh, suddenly uh, change the units in a data set or something like that. Uh, I have, I think, two questions or... Mm -hmm. um, the first one is that Rockhound, as it is now, only downloads data, doesn't store any data of any kind. Um, so if we are moving all the sample data to Rockhound, um, we maybe, uh, what, what's the approach? Should we store all the data inside Rockhound repository or as it is in now in Verde and Harmonica? Hmm. Or... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we deliberately chose sample data that is either public domain or, or liberally licensed. Um, so it wouldn't be too hard to to store. So it, it, I mean, it wouldn't be illegal for us to store it. Okay. Right. The so the bathymetry data in there that. that comes from GMT, but that comes from the no archive. And since it's from the no archive, then it's public domain. Um, so, so that part is, is not a big deal. Um, so but legally, we could. The problem with fetching from the original source is that, as, as Dan knows perfectly well, uh, it can be a pain to fetch from the original source. Um, and they might move things around, which would completely break stuff for us. Uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we could, I think most of our data, we could. So what do we have on, let's see, what do we have on harmonica? And what do we have on? Uh, All right, so for example, so in Harmonica, we have the three grids from ICGM, which we can't, uh, those we can't download from the original source because they're generated uh, upon request. So they're not stored anywhere. Um, then we have the South Africa gravity data from, uh, this is from the, the NOAA, is it from NOAA or USGS? Yeah, from the, the NOAA repository. So that we could download. I think that's just an FTP repository uh, for, for this data set. And for the Britain one as well, um, I guess we could also download that from the original source. But the problem is that a lot of these aren't compressed properly on the server. Uh, so for the Britain magnetic one, we did a lot of compressing to get the data download as small as possible. So that that might not be ideal then if we're downloading it from from the original source. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think enable, enabling Rockhound to store its own data uh, would be nice. Um, and this gives me the, the idea that we were discussing it from a while. Um, for example, as you mentioned, some of the data in the original source is not very well uh, compressed. For example, we need Rasterio just for reading some data that could be stored in NetCDF and would be much quicker to load. So yeah. this give, gives me the idea of adding the option to either download the data from the original source or from Rockhound that could be already in a very good compressed format. That way we might reduce um, not only uh, broadband from people that are trying to download it, uh, but also uh, computational speed. I mean, uh, NetCDF, although the NetCDF might be big, it's, it loads very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an option, I don't know. Um, hmm. So well, one thing we have to check, uh, the, the, the thing is that a lot of the stuff we have on Rockhound, um, it's not really, licensed which is yeah. why we don't really store it <laughs> right so uh, i think prem has a license on on the iris server but um and i guess etopo one this is also hosted on the noah servers so it, it's probably public domain as well um but i don't know so i, I don't know is there a license for slab 2 for bedmap no uh, slab oh. Oh, slap. Um, oh. No. No, there's no license for that. I remember Austin, I was struggling with uh, getting a license for that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, I mean, if we cannot store it because it doesn't have a license, that's a problem. Um, yeah. So one thing we can do is all, all of these that are public domain or something, um, it wouldn't be a problem for us to format that and then upload it to Zenodo instead of storing it in the Git uh, on GitHub. Um, and then we could just download things from Zenodo. Okay. Uh, uh, so we could do that for for any data set that, that has a license or is in the public domain. Um, I'm guessing the the age of the lithosphere and that, that sort of data set, we, we might be able to get those or we could try contacting the authors and seeing if they, they're interested in collaborating on that. Uh, so then for anything that we can't, then we can leave it as it is right now, which is not optimal. So I remember you said you had a lot of trouble with the Slab 2 model um, for actually being able to download it in a sensible format and load it into NetCDF. Uh... Yeah, I don't remember now. Let me. <laughs> yeah, we were struggling with two with Lito uh, 1.0, uh, with mm. Slab 2. Yeah, those... Oh, yeah, no, that, that was the Lito one. Yeah, yeah the Lito one is, oh, it's crazy. <laughs> it's so, it's, I don't know, I think, uh, yeah, 50,000 ASCII files, one per node. And has all the um, the um, yeah the physical properties for each layer, but uh, if on a certain node there isn't a layer, for example, you don't have any sediment, and you have uh, uh, yeah you you don't have that sediment uh, boundary, then the the sediment row is missing. So uh, it's not like you can uh, just append values by index you you really need to uh, see which which boundary you're reading so yeah it's not like yeah. it, it takes a while to load but when once you generate the the net cdf it's it, you can load it in in less than a second so <laughs> 
Yeah, the, a, a smart way to store a stack of grids is one node per <laughs> <laughs> per ASCII file. Uh, yeah, that's that's difficult. Yeah, um, uh, we even found out that some one of the boundaries is uh, is duplicated, so you have to read it twice. And mm -hmm. yeah. So th yeah, this is probably just because the way they generated the model made it easier to output that. Um, and again, I don't think we did. Did, did we ever reach out to uh, to the group developing that and see if they were interested in in our NetCDF file? <laughs> no, I, I think we we haven't contacted them. Um, right, we might. Uh, All right, so sorry. Let me write this stuff down. Actually. Uh, Right, so store so data for which we have rights we can uh, process compress and store in Zenodo others we can contact original authors Right. Uh, yeah. So for the the sample data set shouldn't be a problem because all of those are are public domain, or or they have a, a permissive license. So we could upload all those to Zenodo and source our data from Zenodo instead. Um, right. So the yeah, since these are small, I don't think Zenodo would mind uh, us hitting them several times a day through the CI. Uh, yeah, and that's another stuff uh, regarding CI and Rock Home that we decided mm -hmm. to not test uh, actually downloading every data set because the CIs cannot handle it. Um, so we are currently only uh, checking, I mean, the CIs are only checking if the files are available for download. Um, Yeah, so as soon as we need to download a 100 megabyte file uh, on CI, it, it kind of becomes a problem. Um, um, so s something else I just thought when, when looking at the data sets we have. So we have this interface for downloading. So we download eTOPO1, but we download the original file from uh, from from the the NOAA servers, I guess. Um, but one thing we could do is uh, so GMT has several versions of Earth Relief grids that that Paul made. So these are um, all the way from SRTM tiles uh, blended with bathymetry, so with fifteen arc second bathymetry, all the way up to uh, I think it's one by one degree resolution topography with several steps in between. So you can choose your own resolution and, and have it um, and have GMT download the, the grid. Some of those are tiled, some aren't. But that's all in the GMT servers. And we're looking to upload those to Zenodo as well. Uh, so if, if that, well, even if the upload to Zenodo doesn't happen, we could source those files through Rockhound as well. Because the, the problem with eTOPO one is that it's really really large for for running on CI or for doing a lot of the gravity processing and stuff like that. Um, it's a bit too much, so you would need to downsample it anyway, and downsampling can be a little bit tricky. And with those grids, Paul has run like uh, uh, low pass filtered before downsampling and all that that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, th those might be good for us to maybe try to source. Uh, yeah, so we could we could have an interface for that that doesn't depend on GMT, which um, 
Yeah, so we can already download those through PyGMT, but then you need to be able to install GMT, which is a, a big uh, a big hassle a lot of times. And I wouldn't want to depend on, I mean, I, I, I use PyGMT, but I wouldn't want to depend on PyGMT for, <laughs> for a software development. It, it just breaks you too often. Uh, but if, if we can have easy access to the data, that, that would be nice. Right, so so for this, so what, what do we need then to do? Like, is there anything that needs to be done right now in, in Rockhound, Santiago, uh, so that we can start this? Um, no, I think we can just, I mean, uh, your idea was uploading all the sample data into Zenodo and keep Rockhound as it is, that doesn't store anything and just, uh, has the code for fetching everything, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, okay. it would basically mean getting everything that's in all the package, uh, the all the data set packages, and moving that to Rockhound, and maybe pointing the download towards Zenodo instead. Okay. So now I I mean we just need to move the the fetching functions to Rockhound and mm -hmm. tell every package to use it. One okay. thing I'm a little bit, a little bit concerned is, um, should we uh, make better uh, fetching functions to actually point towards the rock on fet fetching functions? Because otherwise we might break backward compatibility. Yeah, so, so this would be a backward incompatible change. So we can keep um, for now, I don't think it would hurt if we kept the, the data set module in Verde and, and in Harmonica. Well, uh, Harmonica is less of a problem because we, we're not 1.0 yet, um, so we can break things. <laughs> yeah. <that's what. laughs> but for, for Verde, uh, yeah. So we have already some, um, some breaking changes planned for Verde 2.0. So breaking the sample data sets wouldn't be too much of a problem because no one's real workflow depends on that right so tutorials depend on those but but no one's uh, like it, you wouldn't be using this for for research i guess um yeah so then we could transition the documentation to use the rockhound packages uh, to use rockhound instead and then deprecate the the data set module uh, with a, like a deprecation warning whenever it's used and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And and then when when we have all the breaking changes that we want to make, then we can do a 2.0 release and then completely delete that module. But people would have at least like two or three releases to prepare with with us just nagging them that this is going to go away. This is going to go away. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully that should be enough. But Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's a, yeah, so it's it's not a huge thing, but yeah, we never know who's using what for. Oh no, we yeah we use it in harmonica, don't we? Yeah. Oh right, yeah. Uh, so, see, you, you never know who's depending on your <laughs> stuff. <laughs> oh right, I forgot about that. But I mean, uh, on my current research, I'm pinning a certain version of of harmonica and Verde, so. Yeah. Uh, no problem with that. Um, All right. So I agree. So for, yeah. yeah, yeah. Continue. No, so I was just gonna say for some context. Uh, so in Harmonica, the Santiago made a couple of functions that generate um, generate survey layouts, um, and he did that by slicing some of the sample data sets and then rescaling them to whatever area you need. So you actually have. A layout from a real data from a real survey to do a synthetic, um, and that relies on the the sample data. Uh, right, but well, we could move that to Rockhound as well in, in that case. Yeah, um, uh, I, I mean, we are free to break things in Harmonica for now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, kind of interesting. My my feeling as well is that if it's for the tutorial, it's not as critical. You know, 
probably that nobody's work using this for anything that they're actually working on. Mm -hmm. um, unless we happen to choose exactly the right data for them for some reason. But, well, you guys chose, well, say we. Um, but, so, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily an issue if if we have to change how the tutorials get set up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when, uh, what was I going to say? No, to, uh, on the, the notes of the synthetics, uh, one thing that would be cool is if we could get a random section from a, a survey instead of a fixed section. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's not, not re relevant right now. Um, right, so, so I guess we can start migrating start migrating the data sets to Zenodo uh, and the, the fetch functions to rock count. Okay. And then need a commit to harmonica and Verde to deprecate the uh, data sets modules once this is done. Okay, so we, we have a good road, road map there. All right, then it might be worth uh, chatting with uh, Simpeg and, and PyGimli and seeing if they have any data sets that they're using. Um, I know that Simpeg has some stuff in their in their case histories stuff they they have some data sets that they use routinely no idea what the license is on any of those uh, but I think they might be interested in 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 joining forces in this uh, Lindsay uh, showed a use a, a data set from an old paper from the 80s on the tutorial that uh, she gave on on the transform 2020 um, so that might be a good uh, starting point for adding mm -hmm. those data. I, I don't know the, the license, so, but if they, ha they have an original source. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have no idea what the restrictions are on using data from papers. It's like if you copy and paste their PDF table onto a text file <laughs> and cite it. Is that enough? Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Um, it sounded like one of the guys who helped set up the tutorial originally or set up that data is the guy who collected it. So the original inversion and the, the, the whoever did the original inversion back in whenever they collected the data um, sounds like they're still around at UBC, so it might be his data type of thing. Um, mm. So I'd imagine if it's in the tutorial that she does have permission from the original collector. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's the same as having permission from who it was collected for and all of that, I'm not sure. But um, that was just the impression I got during the tutorial was that it was the same guy who... And it was it, it, It's Perfect. from the source, basically. On a flash drive, handed over type of thing. <laughs> Here is the data we collected twenty years ago. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if it's available anywhere else. Oh. yeah. I mean, if 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 the person is willing to share their data set like that, I don't think they would mind if it's more widely used and maybe even generating some citations for him. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, on, on the, the topic of data sets, I've been chatting with some people from the Brazilian Geological Survey as well, because uh, they have uh, they have an online database of, I think, almost every single air, air, aeromagnetic survey that they ever did in Brazil. So they have the whole country covered pretty much and with a, a few data gaps. So there's several gigabytes there worth of aeromagnetics and a lot of them have um, 
uh, radio metrics as well. But that has the same problem that it's there, but the license is not clear. Uh, the Brazilian government does have a freedom of information law, but I'm not entirely sure that it applies to those surveys as well. Uh, and of course, there's no license on the data set the, on the, the website. It says nothing. So I've been trying to find the people who are responsible for that inside the organization because I, I have a couple of friends who ended up working there. But I'm trying to see if they, they can connect the dots and find the people there and say that, that yes, we want licenses. <laughs> like, please, if you want people to use it, please put something like a Creative Commons or just make it public domain. Um, but yeah, so if that goes through, then that that's a wealth of of data to play around with. Yeah, it might. It's yeah. I know a couple of people in the South African Council as well. Um, you remember that link that I shared with you? We had Gravity. Mm. Um, it's it's gridded already. So, but it's it's Gravity Mag and Radio Patchy Radiometric stuff as well for the whole of South mm -hmm. Africa. Um, I can maybe chase a couple of people I know at the council and say, hey, what's actually the reuse on this, given that, you know, it's it's the same issue. It's there on the website. There's nothing you have to do. You just go to the page and go, OK, download and you get a, you know, 500 meg zip file with the mag data. But what can I do with this? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's the exact same thing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, if, if you want to chase that up, like we can, that would be a really cool thing to have in Rockhound if we can source those data sets, uh, especially if it's easy to download. Uh, one thing I've kind of dreamed of is having an interface for ICGM. So I don't know if uh, for a minute, that's a, uh, a website that has a, a spherical harmonics rendering service. So they host a whole bunch of gravity models, and on if you go to their website, you can say, I want a grid that's the within this bounding region. I want the grav gravitational potential with this grid step and from this model, and they'll just synthesize it for you. Uh, so that's super convenient. And geoids, which you hate. Yes, yes, there's <laughs> geoids as well. That's what I'm using for. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't hate geoids. I just don't see a use for them in in gravimetry. But <laughs> but uh, again, I'm not a geodesist, so uh, I'm biased. <laughs> um, yeah, so having an interface to that would be nice. So I tried to dig into their code, but uh, yeah, it's a bunch of server code um, that that does the calculations. So there's no there's no REST API or anything like that. But, if there were, it would be super easy to build it without involving them, and then and then just saying like, "Hey, I built this," um, but that's that's not the way it's set up. So we we can't really make an API request. It's uh, some uh, weird PHP going on there. It it reminded me of very like 1998 kind of web yeah. design. Very impressive, yeah. but. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I mean, still super useful. I, I use it all the time, but but yeah, it, it could use a more modern, uh, more modern look, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think that maybe having uh, CIs running, uh, asking models, that would be really annoying for them because they are not only storing data; they are actually computing data once you ask. So, yeah. And so I, I wouldn't use that for the for for getting the the data sets for for getting our sample data sets because yeah you're right that that would just be a huge drain on their their resources, um, but again like if I'm downloading some data for a class or for 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 doing some research, it would be nice if I didn't have to go to the the website, you know, and, and plug things in, but yeah. Maybe they, they just want us to go to the website. Um, As you said, it was a very it's a very impressive website. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, their their sidebar is very 1990s. <laughs> but yeah, it's missing some gifts though. Or or is it actually? Do they when have maybe the spinning geoid cursor around? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sparkles, you know, when when you move the cursor, yeah. Uh, all right, so I think, um, I mean, from 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 me, I think that's that's all I kind of had on my mind. Um, does anybody have anything to else to to uh, bring up or or that they wanted to discuss? They use Comic Sans on the on the title. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bold. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Supposedly, Comic Sans is actually great if you're dyslexic because, like, the P's and Q's are not symmetric. So there are other Q's. So actually, mm -hmm. it's really a victory for uh, accessibility. Yeah. But, you no, know, I was going to say in Rockhound, you have the Bedmap 2 data set. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's behind this annoying login process, but there's this new one called Bed Machine. Have you seen it? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. So that one's really nice, and I don't know what your use case is for it, but worth looking into. So, I don't quite yeah, remember yes. why we inputted that. Oh, uh, because I was trying to make some inversions with the okay. ice uh, sheets. Um, so I use it for reference mm. of where to put and or remove mass from. Uh, that's the main goal. Um, yeah, and I've seen the bed machine came up this year or last year. It was like January, I think. Okay. That he he's had the one for Greenland for a while now, um, but the one for Antarctica was pretty recent. The be yeah. bed map has pretty brutal Kriging artifacts in a lot of places, and anyway. Okay. Yeah, we we might open an issue to. Uh, create a function for the bed machine or does it or do we need some uh, authentication first yeah you need a, a login for NASA earth data which is easy to get it's just another hurdle so what's the license on these data sets uh, uh, is it clear or, or is it the it case where it's all public domain should be let me I mean I can look now if you want me to find out mm -hmm. it's on the National Snow and Ice Data Center I think Basically, it's going to be public domain because the U.S. government paid for it. Yeah. Uh, let me see. If you got a split, this is definitely not pressing, but I'm sure it's going to be permissive enough. Mm hmm Oh, because if it is, we could, um, like, if there's anything that, that that we need to add to the NetCDF. A lot, a lot of times as well, these models, they're missing some metadata that that would be nice to have in the NetCDF. I, um, it's definitely in this kind of CF 1.6 metadata standard. Okay. Um, so for example, it has all the right stuff in it for being able to read a, read a field out of it directly from Rasterio, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think their usage is basically just, you have to cite it. And that's all, at least okay. it's on the website. I don't see like a license as such, but well, anyway. Yeah. It's so cool. well, uh, yeah. If it's the case that's public domain, then then yeah, we could maybe put it on up on Zenodo or something. If it makes yeah, it more had, convenient to source. That. I had wondered about that. Um, I mean, I know the guy who made it, so I can ask him. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better better to consult <laughs> yes. than to step on anyone's toes. Yeah, yeah. That that's one thing we're still struggling with um, with Rockhound is, is yeah. actually how to how to run things and how to test them and uh, how to generate the galleries in a more efficient way. Because uh, we really like... can't be. Yeah, go, sorry. sorry go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say that we, we can't run these things on CI because we, we, we only have five data sets and it already takes way too long on the CI 
because it has to download these things every time and then loading them takes a while generating the plots takes a while okay i'm i'm encountering a similar problem because i have all these um you know tutorials i have for ice pack and for some of them i'm using real data like ed machine or some of the velocities of antarctica which are you know order of five six gigabytes each and really what i'm doing just now is doing it manually when there's some you know every week or so i'll rebuild all the documentation on my home machine and just push it to github pages manually which is fine but kind of stupid and i wish there were some good way of automating all this so i think for some of them you can cache certain files in ci so i think usually people use this for caching tar files of docker images so that they don't fetch their docker image every time but mm. in principle i don't know it was something that occurred to me of if you could cache big data sets in between in principle you might only have to do that once or at least only as mm -hmm. long as uh you know the data set itself hasn't been updated or the hash hasn't changed yeah so anyway, i feel your pain. we can you figure something out <laughs> yeah. let me know uh so I kind of, we thought of trying to do that. One thing that I was reading some of the CI documentations is that the the cache data isn't really sitting on the same machine as the the, the build images. Oh, so it, it's still being downloaded. It's just being okay. downloaded from somewhere else. Yeah. So what they were recommending is, uh, you so you should cache things that take a long time to compute, not that take a long time to download. Right, so that for example, compiling your code. Yeah, if you're if compiling your code takes half an hour, right. then you can cache the compiled artifacts because then the download is faster than the compile the compilation. I'm glad we had this conversation because otherwise I would have tried it. Yeah, so I I, I don't think it's gonna help. I think uh, yeah. it, it I'm, it's not gonna break, but it, it, I think it'll just take almost as long, uh, yeah. unless the original server is really slow. Yeah. Right, so, so there might be a speed up because, I mean, it, even if it's not the same server, it's probably closer and with a better connection than, than maybe sure. the NASA server. But at that rate. Yeah, it, it, it might help, but it's not a, it's not a solution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Might be in the same data set, da same data center. So mm -hmm. yeah. quicker yeah. download, but not that much quicker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dan, and we also uh, find out that the, I think the new GitHub Actions, you can uh, run your own GitHub Actions in your own workstation. So we were really excited about it. That We said, OK, let's install the workstation and run our own CIs. And then you find a big, big warning saying, don't uh, use your own GitHub Actions on public repositories because anyone could run any code on your machine. So <laughs> big, big security woman. Yeah, OK, that's that's reasonable. <laughs> Glad they told us. <laughs> yeah. Um, huh. yeah. Well, yeah. So if I... my thinking is um, uh, maybe a way to automate it is to I mean, you, you'll still have to run it, but you could have a script that, that does it. So the same sort of script that, the, that we have that runs on Travis CI, mm -hmm. uh, we could take that and sort of generalize it to run on, on your machine instead of, because it has built in like checking for some Travis CI environment variables. Um, so we could strip those out and make a script, and then you could put that script on a cron job or something. And then yeah, the thought had occurred to me. I mean, then I think this is stupid. I don't need to update the documentation all that often. There's nothing wrong with doing it manually. But then there's just this compulsive little like, no, but you must automate it. Um, well, yeah. So just the script might be nice as well. Because tell you this because it, you'll understand. Just the... Yeah, of course. No, the, well, for for me, it's not it's not that doing it takes a long time. Is that remembering how to do it takes a long time? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, There's I never remember as well as the data cache. Yeah, <laughs> and if you're if you're doing this like once a week or or once a month, at, at least I, I'm not the kind of person who remembers things that happen only once a month. Like, 
Yeah. So yeah, we so have. If I, yeah. Sorry, uh, on Rockham we have the this pull request template that reminds you to. Uh, so the whole idea is that on Rockham the gallery would be only updated when a new data set comes in, or maybe if you screwed some data set and you want to fix it. So we decided to add a reminder on the pull request template that you must uh, compile the gallery before merging. So, mm -hmm. and it has the instructions. <laughs> yeah. So they're somewhere, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, yeah, so what we have is that the, the repository now includes the Sphinx gallery generated files. Mm. And and when we build the docs on CI, we don't run this. We don't run Sphinx Gallery as well. Um, so we're basically just keeping the build artifacts and not running it. Yeah. Um, but then that that means that the scripts that generate the pods they don't get run all the time. So if you if you touch one of those scripts in your pull request, you have to remember to commit also commit the files uh from the from the gallery gotcha so that sort of works so we yeah we still have the docs building on ci it just doesn't build the galleries yeah makes sense um have you seen at all what the gitlab ci looks like uh no no so yeah i mean i was building a personal website and basically what i wanted to have was a bunch of Jupyter notebooks that get executed and uh, converted to restructured text and whatnot. And mm -hmm. it's actually kind of astonishing how much easier it is. I, yeah. I can show you the results, but anyway, we've gone on long enough, but that's- Yeah, if you, if you could yeah. paste those in the notes or something like that, that or, yeah. or share them on, on Slack. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're we're taking our time with, with adopting github actions instead of travis but i think that's gonna be the the way to go in the future yeah uh yeah uh, travis is in the, the it's going down of, I, I don't imagine it'll be well, around they, for they got long. bought out by some vulture private equity firm and they fired what three quarters of the engineers or something and it's yeah i switched as soon as that happened i was like i can see the way this is going and i just switched all <laughs> circle instead yeah, well, I mean, right now we mostly depend on them for all the the deployments, um, but I think that's going to be easier with GitHub Actions because to deploy to GitHub pages, you don't really need to set up like an encrypted deploy key, and GitHub does that all that automatically. Uh, okay, that is nice. Yeah. Yeah, but it takes time to go and fiddle around with it and test and see if it works. More stuff to tweak. Yeah. So yeah. more stuff to learn, and that's not and then, directly related to the job. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I think uh, we'll wrap up because uh, it's going on an hour now. Uh, but yeah, thanks, everyone, for, for showing up. This was a good discussion. I thought we were going to run out of things to say, but apparently, uh, if you put four nerds in a, <laughs> in a chat room, we can talk for hours. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much what IOC was built on. We, <laughs> we didn't even get to talking about our favorite Vim plugins. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, we all have those in our .files repositories, right? Sure, you know, they're all public. <laughs> compare. We don't use somebody else's .file. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. So a good chat and see yeah. you around see you around the internet and maybe talk next month then. Cool. Okay. Cool. Have a good one. All right. See you. Have a good one. Cheerio.